Welcome everyone. I hope you are all safe and well. Thank you for joining us today for a special event. My name is Isa Dextra. I'm part of the Oxford Climate Society events team and an undergraduate student at Oxford. The Oxford Climate Society is a student society at the University of Oxford that aims to develop the next generation of informed climate leaders. In addition to our speaker events, we run ed educational programs throughout the year, including our award-winning School of Climate Change, which taught over 1,500 people from all over the world last term. We also run the world's largest stu student-run climate journal, Anthroposphere, and are currently working with the university to develop net zero policies and to incorporate climate into the university curriculum. The topic of today's event is the European Green Deal. While EU emissions fell by over 20% between 1990 and 2017, this is nowhere near enough to become net zero by 2050. The European Green Deal strives to fill this gap by overhauling nearly every major aspect of the European economy, from energy generation to manufacturing and construction. It aims to address not only the climate crisis, but also improve people's quality of life through cleaner air and water, better health and a thriving natural world and to leave no person or place behind. However, the deal has been subject to criticism due to a perceived lack of ambition. In fact, the plan and its targets are, as many European policies, the result of much negotiation and compromise. On the one hand, at least eight EU countries wanted to increase the 2030 emissions reduction target, currently at 55%. On the other, Poland and Hungary claimed it was already beyond the necessary. In December 2019, the European Council decided to press ahead with the plan, but with an opt-out for Poland, as they believed climate neutrality in 2050 will not be possible due to their reliance on coal as their main power source. Moreover, the director of the Centre for European Reform think tank predicted that the EU will also face backlash from its citizens, pointing out the Gilets jaunes protests in France which took off after rises in fuel taxation intended to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Complicating matters further, the COVID-19 pandemic diminished focus on the Green Deal and the financial market being under immense pressure with a reduction in economic factor might threaten the feasibility of the 1 trillion euro plan. To discuss these challenges and the opportunities moving forward, we are delighted to welcome two experts in the topic, Professor Otmar Edenhover and Linda McEvan. Professor Otmar Edenhover is one of the world's leading experts on climate change policy, environmental and energy policy, and energy economics. He is the director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, as well as the Berlin-based Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change. Linda McEvan is a British Labour Party politician and was a member of the European Parliament from 1998 to 2019. Since leaving the European Parliament, she has been working as Executive Director for European Relations at the European Climate Foundation, an initiative that is dedicated to responding to the global climate crisis by creating a net zero greenhouse gas emission society. Thank you both so much for joining us today. To start the event off, I will now hand over to Otmar. Now, can you, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Okay, good. So, Isa, thanks a lot for the kind invitation to the Oxford Climate Society and for the opportunity to talk about the European Green Deal and also the reform options, uh, in particular for carbon pricing. Now, in her State of the Union speech in, in 2020, uh, Ursula von der Leyen announced a new climate target for 2030. And in addition to that, uh, Ursula von der Leyen highlights that the Commission will review and propose to revise, where necessary, all relevant climate-related policy instruments. We are in the middle of debate. And what I would like to do is, in my talk, to highlight the main uh, options which are now discussed uh, for this uh, kind of uh, reform and indeed uh, a necessary reform. Uh, why? Now this is the EU path towards climate neutrality and this was basically the old one uh, where uh, the uh, climate neutrality was 
was wouldn't be achieved by 2050. Now the new goal is the minus 55 percent by 2030, and in addition to that, carbon neutrality by 2050. Now let me highlight what kind of structural changes are necessary in order to achieve that goal. First, acceleration of the power sector decarbonization. You can see this on the slide. Accelerated electrification of end uses. Third, bioenergy and synthetic e-fuels to cover residual non-electric fuel demands. And I will highlight this important aspect at the end of my talk. And the most important thing is, which is not very often discussed at the European level, these are negative emission technologies, carbon dioxide removal technologies to offset the remaining emissions. So here you see this here at, 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 the, green, um, at the green area here. But let me highlight here one important aspect. Carbon dioxide removal technologies cannot be used to remove uh, and to postpone emission reductions. We need rapid emission reductions in order to achieve the uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. What we, own, we use, we, we need the carbon dioxide removal technologies in order to offset, uh, de this kind of emissions from industry, which cannot be mitigated. But for uh, neutrality, for the neutrality goal, negative emissions are necessary. So this is basically the structural change which is ahead of us. These are the goals. But the crucial things, from my point of view, are not just the goals. The most important aspect of the current reform and the current debate is what kind of instruments, what kind of governance structure do we need to achieve such a goal? Now. Um, in order to achieve the 2000, we are now at this level in 2020, minus 55% uh, by 2030, carbon neutrality by 2050. Now, what kind of, of institutional reform scenarios are on the table? First of all, uh, are, these are the, the impact assessment of the EU Commission. And you can um, distinguish this kind of reform options along two dimensions. The first dimension is the role of CO2 prices and the role of complementary measures. And let me highlight at least the three most important options. The first option is what the EU Commission calls the regulatory framework. What does this regulatory framework imply? It implies that the current European emissions trading scheme has its uh, current scope, which uh, consists of power and industry, intra-EU aviation and navigation. The most important aspect of this regulatory measure is twofold. Outside the EU ETS, in particular uh, for building, for transport, uh, for heating. So there will be no emission trading scheme. This will be regulated within the so-called effort sharing regulation, where member states have obligations and how they implement the obligations for their consumers and for their companies is, is up to them. And there are uh, a lot of complementary measures, energy, energy efficiency policies, renewable energy policies, and in the transport sector, uh, the uh, technology and the performance standards. So this is one extreme. The other extreme is the C price scenario. The C price scenario uh, um, um, would imply that we have one consistent European emissions trading scheme, which does not only consist of power and industry and intra-EU aviation and navigation, but consists also of road transport and buildings. The most important aspect of the C price scenario, and you see this is a, a quite radical scenario, there are no additional complementary measures, no additional uh, uh, energy efficiency policies, no additional renewable energy policies, and basically no technology standards. Of course, if you want to promote as a politician a third scenario, create uh, two extreme scenarios, then you can advocate a, a, a more a moderate scenario. This is called the mixed scenario. The mixed scenario shares with the C price scenario, uh, the scope of the current emissions trading scheme, but it uh, relies much more on uh, complementary policies for energy efficiency, renewables, and so on. 
Now, these are the options which are on the table. And I would like to explain you a little bit more what does this, this imply uh, for, um, for the decarbonization pathways. In order to do this, um, I provide you a preliminary assessment of the marginal abatement costs. The costs uh, of abatement of emission reduction in the different sectors. And we calculated this with uh, a long-term uh, model. And I start to explain you uh, the, the implications uh, for the uh, marginal abatement cost curve in the CO2 price for the old minus 40% scenario. Given the current division of labor between the, uh, ETU, the, the, S, the UETS system and the so-called effort sharing regulation sectors, which are basically transport, heating, and, and building, and to a certain extent, agriculture. So this means, uh, given the division of labor, minus 30% for the effort sharing regulation and minus 43% for the ETS. And this would have an implication on, on, on costs and prices. Uh, in the current ETS system, we would see a price between 30 to 60 euros per ton CO2. In the effort sharing regulation, we would see marginal abatement costs between 100 uh, to 200 euros per ton CO2. Why is this such a range of CO2 prices? It's about uncertainty. It's about the use of multiple models with different approaches and multiple calculations with different values for uncertain, in particular, uh, policy and technology parameters. Now we calculated basically, and this is this is consistent what uh, basically other institutions in Germany, like the environmental ministries and the economic ministry, has calculated. But now let me talk about the implications of the new minus uh, 55% by 2030. In order to assess these scenarios, uh, we we have to distinguish the following. Uh, it's the division of labor between the two sectors. So I provide you first the two scenarios, and then I try to evaluate the political feasibility of the two scenarios. The first scenario is that the division of labor is uh, consistent with the additional uh, reduction like the current split. So it's, it's basically an, a proportional reduction given the current split between uh, uh, power, the power sector and the industry sector on one on the one hand, and the transport, the building, and the heating sector on the other hand. So this is an implication, a strong implication. And the strong implication is we would see uh, in the ETS sector a reduction of minus 63%, and in the effort sharing regulation sector, a reduction of 45%. But this comes uh, literally with the price. And there's a huge differential between the marginal abatement cost curves with between these two sectors. We will see in the ETS uh, uh, prices between 80 to 150 euros per ton CO2. Outside the sectors, in the other sectors, uh, uh, costs between 350 to 500 euros per ton CO2. This is one scenario, and obviously it's not a cost-effective scenario because in a cost-effective scenario, we would see a convergence of the prices. And uh, for the sake of uh, comprehensiveness, we calculated this additional uh, reduction scenario. And we come up so roughly with the same prices across the two sectors. But the problem with that is a political one. If we would reduce the emissions according to, uh, to cost efficiency, this would imply that the current ETS sector, power sector, and uh, industry would have to reduce their emissions by uh, 80% by, by 80%, which is enormous. And the effort sharing regulation sector only with 30%. Why? Because the marginal abatement cost curves in the other sectors are so much higher as I have you shown here. However, and this should be very clear, that the cost efficient scenario, which might be promoted by economists, is absolutely rejected by the industry and the lobby groups at the national scale, at least in Germany, and also in, in, in other EU member states, but in particular also at the European level. So this is very unlikely that this scenario uh, will be implemented. It is much more likely that we will see the other scenario where we have, a, 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 let's say, a, 
a fair division of labor across the sectors. But this will come with the price, and the price is a huge differential in mitigation costs, which is politically very, very demanding. Okay, so that's uh, that's something which which I would like to highlight. And in the assumption here is that the rest of the world is also pursuing a two degree or a well below two degree uh, scenario. But this has has comes comes also with some distributional challenges uh, of uh, such a uniform ETS for the member states because we see this proportionally high burden of a, such a uniform carbon price or a tax for households in particular in the Eastern member states. And there are larger differences between then within the countries and large differences with income groups. So compensation measures are required. Compensation measures are required, whatever you do, because our goal is so ambitious that low income households need some kind of compensation. And I, I want to show here this with an example from Germany, uh, which, which seems to me is, uh, in that sense, uh, a quite telling one. First of all, here you see the quintiles uh, across the households, the poorest 20% and the richest 20%. And if you Im impose a carbon price roughly around 45 euros per ton CO2, and in Germany, we are very close to impose this in the transport building and in the heating sector, so then you can see that this kind of carbon pricing scheme is quite regressive. So the poorest household have to, to, to pay and have to, to be a, a relatively high burden. If you use the carbon revenues to recycle them to all the households on an equal per capita manner, so it is quite obvious that this carbon price pricing scheme becomes very progressive. So there is a net benefit for the poorest households. Why? Because their uh, proportion, the, the share uh, they, they use for transport and for heating on their income is quite high. So in that sense, when you, when, when you pay back um, this on an equal per capita manner, so you can see they have a huge benefit and you can transform this quite regressive carbon pricing into a very progressive scheme. Unfortunately, we haven't taken the, this part in Germany. What we did is we have reduced the electricity price and have increased uh, the social transfers a bit. So this has then reduced the burden for the poorest households and the whole thing becomes a little bit more progressive, but compared with the equal per capita recycling, it's, it's, it's not regressive enough. Now, what, else, what is now at, at the stake at the European level and nobody knows what exactly will happen uh, my guess is that we will not see the regulatory scenario because the regulatory scenario has a high risk of going nowhere. Why? Because this is just the current um, uh, the current uh, effort sharing regulation, which imposes some obligations on member states, but it is very unclear what will happen if member states will not fulfill their obligations. So therefore, and this is, from my point of view, a debate which we should facilitate is uh, what can we do to use this mixed scenario as a kind of an intermediate scenario in order in the long term to get a much more comprehensive carbon price at the European scale. You might think, okay, this is this typical academic idea, a uniform carbon price promoted by economists, but completely uh, uh, unrealistic uh, at, at the European scale. And I would like to make now first, uh, hopefully to convince you how this intermediate step could look like. And at the end, I will argue that the, in the long term, a uniform carbon price is necessary in order to achieve a, a climate neutrality by the mid of century. Now, this is where we are today. We have an ETS system and we have the effort sharing regulation for transport and building. And this is what we might achieve in the future. So for, as an immediate step, we basically see two options. I see two options. The first one is just to bring both aspects together in one intermediate step, uh, in one ETS, which brings the, the effort sharing regulation scheme into the system as a kind of an initial endowment of emissions. But this will come with a very high price. And the high price is that 
uh, the power sector and the industry sector has to reduce the emissions at an unprecedented scale. This will not be accepted uh, by the lobby groups and also not accepted uh, by, by the politicians. So an immediate step could be, and this is discussed at the European level, that we may, might have two emission trading schemes, one for energy and industry, and the other one for transport and building, and both are separated. They will have uh, two different prices, but over time, so we might allow them gradually that these prices could, could converge, and in the end, we might end up with a, a, a market uh, scheme, which on the one hand uh, allows us to achieve carbon neutrality because of, of the cap, and secondly, uh, a price which sends a signal uh, to the consumers, uh, to the investors, to the companies at the European level. So you might say, okay, why is this so necessary? Why, why, why one price? Is it really necessary because we then achieve carbon efficiency? Is this really the case? Um, yes, this is the case, but, but I, I find from another angle, it much more important to think about the uh, carbon pricing scheme. And I apologize that I bother you at the end of my presentation with a very complicated uh, 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 graph. But it seems to me it is an important one because the message here, which I would like to convey is that uh, for the transformation pathways at the European level, we have two fundamental strategies in our energy system. The first one is direct electrification. And there is no doubt that if we want to transform the, the transport sector, the heating sector, direct electrification is a very important option. However, direct electrification in all the sectors is even not possible. And therefore, we should think about indirect electrification, where we use uh, the renewable electricity uh, to, uh, to, to produce uh, a green hydrogen. And we need the green hydrogen to produce e-fuels. And here comes my message. If you want to e-fuels, you need CO2. And if you want to be with e-fuels really carbon neutral, you have only two options. Either you use carbon from direct air capture, where you basically uh, absorb carbon directly from the atmosphere, or you use uh, biomass. What you cannot do is you cannot use, you cannot use uh, CO2 from burning fossil fuels. So, and this is the reason, this is a very, very complex value chain. And in order to, to, to make this complicated value chain happen, you need a carbon price because only carbon prices incentivizes uh, a, uh, 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 a structure of the value chain, which does no longer allow to use fossil fuels to produce e-fuels. Do we need e-fuels in the long run? I think there is a, a lot of strange and misleading talks about the hydrogen because there are definitely sectors where direct electrification is significantly cheaper than e-fuels. And this is for example, the case for uh, a passenger light road and, and so on. There, there's a huge sectors, uh, at light duty vehicles, where direct electrification is much cheaper. Well, then you have a, um, a second sector where direct electrification and e-fuels are at similar costs. So heavy duty transport is an, is an example. But then you have a third sector, which is impossible to electrify, like aviation shipping, chemical feedstocks, primary steel. But these sectors have also to be decarbonized if we want to achieve carbon neutrality. Hydrogen is a scarce resource and we have to manage that we use uh, hydrogen and e-fuels in the sectors where they have the largest economic value. And this is the reason why I believe in the long run, we need this kind of carbon pricing schemes because otherwise we cannot incentivize uh, this complex a value chain towards carbon neutrality. So the, the bad message is, the good message is in the long run, we can achieve this, that the e-fuels will be by the mid of the century in the range of the gasoline prices today. But there is a, a long road to go. And therefore we need an immense continuous sub public support required with subsidies. And at the same time, we need increasing CO2 prices in order uh, to facilitate this chain. And again, what I said at the very beginning, we need negative emissions. So, and this is very much related to the debate on carbon neutrality. Now, let me conclude with my presentation. 
I think there is now a reform opportunity within the EU because of its ambitious targets and the regulatory efforts. I think in the long run, we need a comprehensive carbon price reform at all levels, albeit institutional demanding, but it is a worthwhile endeavor. I would say it is even necessary. A dialogue between policymakers and experts is needed. Experts need uh, to map out possible pathways and also to check the political feasibility with the stakeholders. But carbon pricing sends a clear signal that we want to transform our economies uh, into a carbon neutral economy. And this involves a lot of sectors. And I highlighted some of them, transport, heating and building, where hydrogen and partially e-fuels uh, will play an imp important role. I think this is a fascinating opportunity, uh, but I hope that the Commission uh, is now courage courageous enough uh, to come up with a reform proposal, which is not only ambitious in terms of targets, but it is also ambitious in terms of policy instruments and governance structures. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Otmar. Um, that was a really informative uh, presentation. And I think we've all learned much more about emission trading systems. Um, at least I really have. Um, so I'd now I'd like to hand over to Linda. Sorry, Linda, you're still on mute. The perennial Zoom problem <laughs> being muted. Um, well, we heard there about some of the big policy issues that, that are on the table at the moment in Brussels, in, in national capitals, in the European Parliament, about how we're going to decarbonize and reach this new um, net zero minus 55 target. But um, and I thought what I would do to complement that, that very excellent presentation of, of the carbon pricing debate is to talk about the politics of the Green Deal, because these, these decisions on which path we go will be taken by politicians in the, in the coming months. And I wanted to start by reminding us that the EU Green Deal is a political project. It was born out of politics and whether or not it's successful and how ambitious it is will depend as well on the politics of Europe. And, um, and, and this year is pivotal actually in 2021 because it's the year when the Green Deal is gonna land really in, uh, with policymakers. So um, uh, you mentioned Issa that um, the Green Deal is a kind of economy wide across all policy areas of the EU initiative. And that's right. And that's why I think that the Green Deal is a big deal for the EU, because it's not like previous climate packages. I've worked on EU climate packages, 2008, big, the big package then before Copenhagen. But that was about the a narrow range of policies for energy and pricing. The EU Green Deal goes far beyond that. And it looks at every aspect of EU policy. Um, including our trade policy, our, the external relations, the uh, revamp of industrial policy. So it is, it is a quite a big deal. And the question is, where did it come from? Why have we got an EU Green Deal today? Why is it on the table? And the, and the truth is it came out of politics. And we have to go back to the start of this current EU cycle to understand where it came from. Um, now, the EU works in five-year cycles, and those five-year cycle, political cycles start with the European elections. They start with the election of, in, of a new European Commission, which then puts a programme of, of uh, work on the table. And in fact, it's actually two years today since the story of the EU Green Deal began, because it's two years today since, since the last European elections, or across most of Europe, who vote on Sundays it is. Um, because it was on the 26th of um, May 2019 that the people of Europe went to the polls. And I left the European Parliament in April 2019. I didn't stand in the elections in, um, in May that year, even though the UK did take part in those elections. Um, but the whole story we were expecting to come out of those elections in 2019 was about a resurgence of right-wing populists, because the this, this story of the European political cycle 2014 to 2019 was all about the migration crisis, the war in Syria, 
the climate issues had been neglected, despite the fact we'd had the Paris Agreement. They weren't the big political issues of the day. And people were expecting that the new European Parliament could be dominated by populist forces. But what happened when people went to the polls was something a bit different. What we saw instead was the highest turnout in European, European elections for 20 years. It's still 51%, it's still high for secondary elections in a country. And we saw that a lot of young people voted and they voted for green parties. And it, it led to a green wave. And that green wave changed the composition of the European Parliament. And of course, behind that, that green wave in the elections was the street movements, the young people, the Greta phenomenon, the Fridays for the Future, who had, who had put pressure and political pressure, and they'd had their voice heard in those elections. And um, I was looking at some polling from just before the elections and, and, and after the elections. And in Germany, 48% of people said that climate was one of the key motivators behind their political choice in 2019. And 77% said it was one of the top factors in how they voted. So, um, so although the populist right-wing parties haven't gone away, and I'm very mindful of France and, and what's happening with right-wing populism, the outcome of the election was to change the traditional balance in the European Parliament um, and, and give, make the, the, the usual, the, the mainstream party, the EPP, the biggest conservative parties, they lost ground, the Greens gained ground, the new, the new centre party uh, called uh, Renew of Emmanuel, Emmanuel Macron um, also gained a lot of ground. And that created a bigger majority in the European Parliament for green politics. And why is that important in terms of the Green Deal? It's because the European Parliament has, can use it, the power that it has when the new European Commission is appointed to demand policy change. Um, so when the, new, the European Commission is the executive in the EU institutional framework, it's the, it's the European Commission that can draft laws and put them on the table. And the European commissioners are, are nominated by governments, one per member state, each government puts forward somebody. But to take office, those commissioners have to go through, through confirmatory hearings in the European Parliament. It's a bit like the US Congress system. And the, and the president of the, European of the European Commission is subject to a vote in the European Parliament. And when Ursula von der Leyen came, the German Conservative candidate was put forward by the European Council, by the heads of state of the European Union. She was a bit of an unknown quantity and she needed votes in the European Parliament to win. And she wasn't doing that well at first, to be honest. And there was fear that she might, she might lose. And so the, some of the forces in the, in the European Parliament pressed that they wanted a, a response to the young people on the streets, they wanted a green deal. And so this is what prompted Ursula von der Leyen to promise that there would be a big push on climate and to say that her European Commission would deliver the green deal. And um, in the end, she only won by a handful of votes despite having made these pledges, but that committed her to delivering the green deal. So, so, it, was, so it was born out of the politics and the political changes that came through the European elections. And then when she came to office in, in the autumn of 2019, she put a very senior European commissioner in charge, Franz Timmermans, um, in charge of a vice president in charge of climate policy and gave him a say over a number of policy areas. Um, and, they, and every commissioner, whatever portfolio was given, was told they had to respect the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations and work on the Green Deal. Um, there was pressure to reopen. The, the, the European institutions had only closed the package of legislation around the 2030 climate targets in 2018. And people never imagined in 2019 that we'd reopen the package we'd just closed. But in fact, that push, that green push meant that in 20. 19, Ursula von der Leyen said they would look again at the climate targets. And that's why we have the, the new target of minus 55% by 
that um, Otmar Edenhof has just told us about. And that meant that every piece of mainstream climate legislation has now to be reopened because they were all set to deliver minus 40% and now they have to deliver minus 55%. And the Green Deal also made the promise and has as its objective to align every other aspect of EU policymaking with Paris and, and the climate goals. So for example, the common agricultural policy is, is, is happening at the moment actually, big, big fights in Brussels about it, align our trade policy, align our industrial policy with the Green Deal. So, and it's actually at this, it's now today that um, this is coming to fruition because in July, on the, on the 14th of July, on Bastille Day, the European Commission will put on the table what's called the Fit for 55 package of legislation, which will deliver those cuts in emissions that uh, we've been talking about. So before, so I'm gonna say something in a minute about what happens next, what happens when these laws come on the table. And, and whether or not they will actually become laws because they only they'll only be draft laws from the European Commission and will they be adopted, will they be watered down, will they be ambitious? But I thought I'd just say something because I was asked to say a little bit before I do that about the effect of the COVID pandemic on the Green Deal. Um, and um, because of course, I talked about this process of the European Commission coming up with this deal and they announced the package in December 2019. And we all know what happened two months later when the COVID crisis started to, um, started to appear. Um, and there was a fear at that time in the beginning of 2020 that the COVID crisis, deep economic crisis and health crisis could derail the Green Deal. Um, in I was involved in climate legislation in 2008 in the run-up to the Copenhagen summit. And, and I think it, we did lose momentum because of the economic crash in 2008 on climate. We kept the show on the road in the end and, and credit to those who did that, but we didn't make the kind of drive we could have done. Um, but um, in terms of the COVID crisis, my deep fears was that governments wouldn't be interested anymore in climate, but they haven't, that hasn't happened. And in fact, what's come out of the COVID crisis is a decision by the European institutions to push for what, what, what you know, the, the campaign for building back better. And again, that was something which people have campaigned for, that we should learn the lessons from the COVID crisis about how nature can take an unexpected turn. And so the European Commission has put on the table an EU recovery plan. It's um, a big financial plan of 750 billion euros. And it's a, it's a plan of grants and loans to EU, which is available to all EU countries. It's pretty unprecedented because the EU is leveraging its budget to borrow money on financial markets something people ne thought would never happen in the past. So, so this money is on the table. And, and at the moment, countries across the, Europe, the 27 member states are preparing their recovery plans. And they have to submit those recovery plans to Brussels. And, the, and there are conditions for those recovery plans. And one of them is something which climate campaigners fought for which is that a proportion of that money for, for the economic recovery of Europe post-COVID will be spent on um, climate, climate action. So in getting in investment in the kind of technologies we need and the transformations we need to, 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 to get to um, net zero. And also at the same time, the creation of a special fund, a just transition fund for regions which are experiencing um, job losses because of economic, because of the economic problems in, because of the carbon trans, the low carbon transition. So the, so the, so the requirement is that 37% of the funding should go on, on climate action. And quite importantly as well, that the remainder of the funding must, must be for do no harm. It must not harm the low carbon transition. 
And there's a lot of debate about that because there's people, there's a big argument about gas going on. Is Can gas be seen as a transition fuel from coal? Because coal dominates in some countries, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, and should, should be investing in gas. And um, my own view is that we have enough gas infrastructure. We don't need new gas infrastructure. So we shouldn't be putting money into gas. And so, there's, so we're trying to push that we transform how, how the investment decisions are made. And um, the European Commission will be scrutinizing those different um, investment plans um, before the money can be released. And if anybody's interested, there are trackers available um, which are looking at these plans. And, and um, one is by the Wuppertal Institute and E3G. They're looking at, they're analyzing all these different plans. So that's happening as well. So we have these post COVID recovery plans. Uh, which also have a, a very strong climate dimension, which are on the table at the moment. But back to the Green Deal, what happens next? So I, I mentioned that um, the legislation, the European Commission is drafting the legislation. Um, one piece of legislation is already agreed. It's very important. It's the European climate law. It's, um, it, put, it puts into European law the net zero 2050 target. The UK has a climate law. The UK was one of the first countries to have a climate law, to have a climate budget, and to and we, um, that's been put into a binding target in British law. And the, U, the EU has now followed suit and put targets into law. And it puts a 2050 target, a 2030 target, and there will be a 2040 target. It also sets up an independent committee to um, advise on EU policymaking. So that law's in place and the other laws will, will be will, are coming out in the next few weeks. Um, and the people who will decide on those laws are not, you know, the, the, in the British sort of tabloid mythology, it's the faceless bureaucrats in Brussels who impose laws on the unsuspecting public and politicians, but it's not like that. The people who will decide on those laws are politicians. The European Commission can only draft laws, but, but it's ministers from each country, from the 27 member states, and members of the European Parliament who will decide on those laws in the process called co-decision. And so that means that the draft laws can be open to change, and there'll be a huge debate in, in the next 18 months or so. Um, I think you mentioned, Lisa, in your introduction that there are some countries which are recalcitrant on climate legislation, there are others who are more progressive on climate change. Um, so traditionally, Poland has been one of the major recalcitrants and it made its voice heard yesterday at the European Council again on, on climate. Um, the Scandinavian countries have traditionally been more progressive. The UK used to be, when it was a member state, a progressive country. And the, the, in Southern Europe, Spain has just adopted a new climate law. Portugal's working on a new climate law. Greece has also um, announced closure date for its coal industry. Uh, but of course, the key players are going to be Germany and France. And the politics of France and Germany will be key to how successful the, and how ambitious the EU Green Deal is. Um, I, I'm always... A, having an eminent German here it's, it's, it's I feel a bit you know nervous talking about German politics but um, my own experience of Germany on climate policy is that it's always a bit complicated Angela Merkel has always been in the forefront of pushing for climate action and back in 2006 with Tony Blair and others she pushed very hard that there should be a big push before Copenhagen but in reality on the ground the foot soldiers of in from German industry in particular were some of the ones holding back on the climate ambition. And so things have changed in Germany in the last few months. There are elections, of course, in Germany, federal elections in September, and there is a surge in green support. And at the moment, the Green Party is breathing down the neck of the CDU and CSU. Um, the Social Democrats, I mean, I, I am a former Labour politician and very close to the German Social Democrats, but they are plateauing, their votes plattering, and the two front runners for, for the elections are the Greens and the 
and the and the CDU, the CSU. So that's changing German politics. And there was a very important court case a couple of weeks ago where the German courts ruled that the German climate law was not ambitious enough and not in line with Paris and asked the government to reopen the climate law, which it very quickly did and um, has now set a new climate target for 2030 of 65% emission reductions. And, um, and it's making a very real shift in policies. I mean, there's been a major, another major court decision today, I don't know if people are aware, where the Dutch courts have just ruled that uh, Royal Dutch Shell has to change its, its own internal company policy to reduce its emissions. And we're seeing, if you look across Europe at the moment, a whole, a whole raft of legal decisions in courts saying where governments have signed up to Paris, they should deliver on Paris. And that's a new, angle, a new interesting angle of what's happening on climate, legis climate law across the whole of the EU. So in Germany, things are hotting up as the elections um, come in September. In France, President Macron is also under pressure on climate. Um, he's caught between populist forces and you mentioned the Gilets jaunes and of course that has been um, an issue in France. He was stung by that. Um, and as a result of that, and the result of pressure again from the green side of politics, President Macron has had a citizens assembly and citizens assembly has pushed to have a French climate law. And so we all see movement in France as well. France has presidential elections next May and will hold the presidency of the EU um, at the beginning of 2022. And that will be key because the presidency on the EU also um, plays an important role in the driving the legislative process in the um, EU legislative framework. So the, so yeah, the governments on the one side are divided, um, but the European Parliament also has its say on the laws. And in the European Parliament, you've got MEPs from 27 different countries, different political persuasions. Um, there'll be different sensitivities on, on different subjects. Um, there's, there's big fights about the role of biomass at the moment. and. Nordic countries have a different position. They're the progressives on climate, but people say they're not so progressive when it comes to biomass compared with other countries. So, so inside the European Parliament, um, there, where majorities have to be found for the legislation, it is going, there are going to be some interesting discussions. And just for those who, I don't know how many, how you follow the how the EU process works, but there cannot be a European piece of legislation unless the MEPs and the ministers agree the legislation. So those two parts of the process have to make an agreement. So that's going to be happening. And so the laws are coming on the table in, in the next few weeks. They And that will take about 18 months to conclude. And there's one very important aspect of the debate at the moment, which was absent, I think, in previous discussions on big climate packages like this one, and that's the social considerations, the impact on pricing. And uh, we, we heard about that, actually. And I was very grateful to, to my Edenhofer for showing us the impacts on prices. Because in the past, when we were talking about cutting our emissions by 20%, even 30 even 40%, it was companies who were being asked to make the cuts. Now we're asking, we're going to ask um, the public the potential that we're looking at how people heat their homes, the prices affecting them, the cost of driving cars. And so there's a lot more sensitivity about the social costs. And I think if we are going to find the solutions on climate, we have to find ones which are fair, where the costs of the transition are, 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 are borne fairly across society and where compensatory mechanisms are put in place. So maybe I'll stop there. I could say more about the global things, but I'm watching the clock and um, there's many more questions we could ask about the role of, I mean, Europe is important. It's only 9% of emissions, but it's an important global player. We have got the COP coming up. And if we can't get the Green Deal right in Europe, in which has been working on this for many, many years, it's hard to see which, in which part of the globe we could make a major advance. So maybe I'll stop there and take questions to your discussion. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Linda. That was a really interesting insight into the political process of the European Green Deal. 
Um, I also liked how you started with the elections two years ago and the influence of young people, because that was actually the first election that I ever voted in. Um, so it's nice to hear that sort of the young people voting made such a difference. Um, so then I'll now move on to the questions I have. Um, so I think, Linda, what you also really touched about is sort of the breadth of the policies of the European Green Deal and how every major European policy um, has to be reformed. And the European Green Deal, part of that includes a circular economy action plan, um, but there currently seems to be a lack of regulation to promote sustainable design. Um, the regulations which are there focus a lot on regulating energy efficiency and are mostly voluntary approaches such as eco labels, along with green procurement criteria. criteria. So how do we approach issues such as planned obsolescence and promote open source data and stimulate remanufacturing and repair industries in the EU to actually get this circular economy bit of the Green Deal off the ground? Um, I'm not sure, Linda, Othmar, who wants to start off with this question? Then, then I, <laughs> I, I, I try to start. Um, these are many questions, but uh, um, circular economy is is, is definitely an, an important option. But a circular economy has also implications for prices. With without an increase of resource prices, so um, uh, the circular economy uh, will not happen. And and. That the problem is what what concerns me to be honest is is a little bit the following, and Linda highlighted this. Um, if you if you talk and and Linda, uh, forgive me that I, I I blame your profession a bit, but then you in turn you can uh, then blame my profession also. But when I I talk to politicians, it's it's very easy for them to say, oh, let's do carbon neutrality by two thousand fifty, and if you say why why not. Why not five years earlier? Say, okay, five years earlier. But at the same time, when you present them, what are the, the costs, the marginal abatement cost curves with all the uncertainty? But it's it's very clear that we have to pay a bill which is above 100 euros per ton CO2 over the next few years. And then politicians respond immediately, oh, no, no, we, we cannot afford this. And this is, from my point of view, the deep inconsistency that people talk about all sorts of goals, but when it comes to the means, uh, so people become very reluctant to, to, to implement them. And, and this worries me. And, and Linda highlighted one thing, which I basically didn't touch in my presentation. This is uh, the, the current uh, decision of the Supreme Court in Germany. And the Supreme Court decision, the, 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 main, the, the, the main implication of the Supreme Court decision is not so much that Germany has to become domestically more important. This is also one part, but the more important part of this decision was the court, uh, the, high, the Supreme Court, uh, doesn't want to allow politicians to postpone their goals all the time. And this is what we did, at least in Germany. When we realized that we cannot achieve a goal, we, we announced another goal in the far distant future, which was much more ambitious. But this is not credible at all. And, and the Supreme Court uh, uh, asked that the political system to stop this game. And this is, from my point of view, uh, the, the real breakthrough of this, of this Supreme Court decision. And, and this has an implication for us because um, I, I don't think that we, we have a lack of ambitious goals, targets. The target, minus 55%, carbon neutrality by 2050, and in Germany, carbon neutrality by 2035, is incredible, incredible uh, ambitious. And when you basically think then about the circular economy and, and all the additional things, in, in the end, we have to accept that at least in, as an intermediate step uh, to, to, to have higher prices, but we have to manage this. And the last thing which I would like to highlight here is I, I don't want to argue against performance standards in the, in the, uh, in the transport sector. They are important. But uh, performance standards in the in the in the transport sector are very vulnerable to the rebound effects. So you 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 make car more efficient, but at the same time you you make cars uh, uh, much more heavier, and 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 people driving more with cars in in the past. Okay, you can say 
in the past. So in the future, we might have uh, e-mobility. Of course, we might have e-mobility. But even if we would be very, very successful with e-mobility, uh, we, we, we have to accept that old cars will also be on the street for the next few decades. This is what you said about the about the depreciation rate in, in the transport sector. And I think the way how to do this, one way is uh, indeed to, to complement and to combine the performance standards with, uh, with, 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 with carbon pricing in order to incentivize also uh, to, to the drivers can change their, uh, their behavior. So in, in, in that sense, I would say um, uh, that's the way to go. And I, I completely see how politically demanding Uh, such a, a process is. But the last thing what I would like to highlight in contrast to performance standards, where you have basically no revenues uh, generated by the government in order to compensate the low income households with carbon pricing, you have the means that you can compensate the low income households. And I fully agree with Linda, uh, it will become incredibly important because otherwise, uh, uh, European politicians and German politicians and politicians in France, we lose the support for this, uh, for this pathway when, 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 when politicians are not willing to explain people how they want to deal with, uh, with, with all sorts of social, of social conflicts and social hardship. Shall I go, you say? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, well, I agree actually on, on the criticism of politicians plucking targets and it's easy to adopt a target if you're in politics particularly one which is a long way away which you'll never be you'll never be accountable for and so that's why you know we push very hard that there shouldn't be just be a 2050 target but we had to bring the targets closer to home and um, but I think in defense of targets the targets have so far driven change but of course what's happened the 2020 targets, you're picking up the low hanging fruit and that's the easy part. and the harder parts are going to come. And um, Otmar showed us that there are certain sectors where we can decarbonize. You know, we're seeing, we're seeing the wind, you know, we're seeing renewable energy really taking off. And I can remember being in, sitting in the European parliament, hearing people telling me that wind power wouldn't work. You know, we could never use solar panel in the UK because the sun didn't shine. And all those things have been proven to be false. You know, we have got wind power and the UK runs on wind power substantially now. So, um, so targets have had a role. Of course, they have to be underpinned by real policies. They can't just be targets which sit in thin air. And that's what this package of legislation from the European Commission is, is, is designed to deliver. And um, on the issue of, on the, on the back to your question of circular economy action, circular economy action plan, um, I think people know there's a lot to be done on the circular economy. And I was only moaning today about built-in obsolescence of my own printer, <laughs> because I was saying it seems to be conking out. And I think it's because there's, there's all sorts of issue, issues like that, but it is an action plan and the different pieces of legislation will be put into place. And, um, and again, each piece of legislation will have to be fought for and people have to argue for them. So, um, you know, the, and we have to prioritize. I'm not an expert on, on, on the circular economy action, action plan, but it's certainly a part, part of the whole, whole debate. We know that if we want to, for example, you know, we want to have electrification of vehicles, we need rare earth, we need to recycle more, we, can't, we have to be much more cautious of the planet as a whole. So, um, yeah, I won't say anything else. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. And I think also because um, you touched on sort of like new technologies, which at that point um, were like windmills and solar panels. Um, and I think also because Obmar uh, touched about th this um, a little bit about like talking about what structural changes are necessary. So, for example, like the bioenergy and the synthetic e-fuels. So I was wondering what assumptions about like behavioral change and technological innovations are made in the European Green Deal to be able to achieve net zero, would we be able to actually um, follow all these policies and follow all these plans without any technological innovation and behavioral change? Or are large assumptions made about actually what is going to happen in technology and behavior in the next 30 years?
Well, I, I think um, on the behaviour side, I mean, it's been there is a debate, a, a real live debate, which I hear every day between those. I mean, Ursula von der Leyen put it on the table and called it the new European growth strategy. Um, and then there are other people who say we don't need economic growth. You know, we need we need to use less of the planet. So we need to be, you know, we need to be slowing down consumption, etc. So there is, there is a kind of a debate about about uh, on those issues. Um, I think the. I don't know, I suppose. I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, can I, I have a colleague who's working on aviation fuels, and this is in its infancy, the whole debate about, you know, will we fly? You know, there's people saying people shouldn't fly, and we have, you know, Greta Thunberg, she, she's not flying. But my own personal view is that you, you, you don't march technology backwards. People will want to fly and we have to find solutions to how they fly and, and the technology so we need of course we need to invest in new technologies that's what we've done as, as you know throughout history we found new technologies we found solutions yes we can travel less maybe we were talking just before we came into the discussion now about how we you know i'm working at home i'm managing a team across europe on zoom and you know, I, I don't have to travel every week like I used to, and I don't think I would ever go back to doing that. And I think I read this afternoon that the European Commission is going to reduce its office space in central Brussels by 50 percent by 2020, by the end of the decade. So I think we are going to see behavioral, behavioral changes um, coming out of different societal trends. Um, but um, I don't think in the 2030 sort of scenarios, big, big personal changes that are foreseen. But to get to 2050, I think we're going to have to have new technologies and some of those technologies, and I'm sure Otman knows more than I do, particularly about the end of that, the, you showed the hydrogen, the three levels where we can electrify, where it's harder or it's cost neutral. But then the last bit, the last part, how do you have a chemicals industry without, with, without um, fossil fuels, et cetera, that is hard. So yet we're gonna to have to make technological breakthrough to resolve those problems. And we have to start investing now. And part of the Green Deal is actually to create platforms, research platforms to get those technologies in place. Because uh, you know, we, we're gonna to have to have steel. We cannot manage without certain technology, without certain things. Yeah, so, so on, on, on the behavioral side, um, of course, there's a, a lot of behavioral changes are needed, but it seems to me that, that uh, first of all, I don't see a contradiction between behavioral change and, and innovation. Both are needed. And, and without innovation, I don't think this is not a credible plan if you say we do not, should not care about uh, innovation. We just want to rely on behavioral change and then we can be carbon neutral. And COVID is a very good experiment, right? So we have reduced now uh, last year uh, due to COVID. Uh, the emissions, we have reduced them to the level of 2006. This is not good enough. Behavioral change is not simply not good enough. We need behavioral change. But for me, behavioral change, uh, you need, you need the, the right framework for behavioral change. That's important. And most people do not appreciate how behavioral change and intrinsic motivation work together, uh, for example, with economic incentives. Most people think that economic incentives destroy intrinsic motivations, destroy the, the willingness of people to contribute uh, uh, voluntarily uh, to emission reduction. Uh, together with a colleague of mine, we, he carried out very interesting and very interesting experiments with students. And it turns out that when people realize in, admittedly in an experimental setting, that they are confronted with a carbon price, the voluntary abatement, the voluntary emission reduction has been increased. And why was this the case? It was the case that everybody observed that all the others uh, changed their behavior. All the others are reducing emissions so that I also do this. And if, if people realize I reduce emissions, but the others are doing not, so at least you create an incentive or you might say a temptation that people stop uh, to, 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 to contribute voluntarily uh, to that. So from my point of view, uh, it is very, very important to understand that incentives can very work, uh, very, very uh, can work together, and can be aligned to the intrinsic motivations of, of of people. That that's very, very important. 
and 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 this kind of behavioral change is is very desirable. Other kinds of behavioral change. So, uh, for example, if you want to understand the carbon content of a of a product in the supermarket, it it is it is from my point of view absolutely impossible to figure out what's the carbon content. So you you, you want from my point of view the prices should tell you the ecological truth. If you go to the supermarket. Uh, products which are carbon free should be very cheap, and the other product should be much more expensive. And 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 this kind of of change, I think, has to be has to be communicated. And and when alternatives are available for people, or available to people, I think this is something which which can be done. And we see this in in many regions where where this kind of schemes have been introduced when it was communicated well, when people understood. That this this incentivizes also a change in behavior and a change in innovation, and government are transparent how they would use uh, the additional revenues, for example, either for uh, 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 increase the compensation for the poor households or investing in new technologies. So then then people can do this. And the last thing what I would like to explain is uh, a few colleagues of mine of the Potsdam Institute have carried out an empirical study with 6,000 households, and they ask them, um, uh, what is the maximum level of carbon prices you would accept? And uh, my, if my recollection is like 50% of the people said uh, 40 euros per ton CO2 is the maximum. Then the second question was, what kind of compensation scheme you would like to see? Roughly 50% said equal per capita recycling uh, would be my preferable option. And then they asked the people, if your preferred compensation scheme is implemented, what level of carbon price would you accept in your personal life? And then people responded uh, uh, more than 50% that it is above 100 euros per ton of CO2. And this confirms that uh, policymakers have to communicate in the right way uh, with, with the people uh, explaining, uh, for example, how carbon pricing works. Secondly, that there is a compensation and then uh, when the compensation is credibly implemented, so then people will also expect then higher prices. And this seems to me, this is something which, which has, to con has to convey much more proactively in the public in the public's, uh, in the public square. Thank you so much. And that last example, I think, was also really illustrative of how um, actually like carbon prices can go hand in hand with behavioral change and that money is indeed an important part of it. Um, then I wanted to move on to a topic that you also both touched upon um, in your speeches, which is about sort of environmental justice and making sure that like everyone is rightly compensated. So besides sort of the um, it, like having to be price wise equally distributed, a large issue of climate change is also that climate change itself impacts different places differently. So, for example, in Europe, the Mediterranean region, for example, is uh, likely to suffer uh, large water shortages quite soon um, within this millennium. So I was uh, I wanted to ask both of you, um, both in terms of financial compensation and sort of climate adaptation measures that help more vulnerable member states. Do you think the European Green Deal is doing enough? Um, in terms of environmental justice. Otmar, would you like to start off? Um, yeah, so, so that's an important issue, but but uh, if you allow me, I, I would like to highlight an, an important aspect uh, for, the, for the Green Deal. Um, one aspect which worries me really is, and, and this is a little bit related to the, the, the COP in, in, in Glasgow, what really worries me, if, if you look at the, at the recovery plans outside Europe, in particular in the smaller uh, Southeast Asian countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, Bangladesh, and a few others, they have a lot of investments in coal-fired plants uh, in, in, in their recovery plans. So fortunately, so some countries start to, to rethink their investments. But this is a huge, a huge challenge. It's not only that China and uh, India is investing in coal, it's that in particular, the smaller South Asian countries are investing in coal to an extent, which in the end could lead to a situation where the, the Paris targets, the well below two degree target are no longer feasible. 
So in that sense, we, we, can, we should not only talk about Europe, and particularly when we talk about environmental justice, we have to talk, uh, and we should start in, in, in Glasgow to talk about a global coal phase out, because uh, for the next five years, this is the biggest issue. And therefore, I would like to see uh, the uh, Europe, the EU, uh, to come up with a plan where basically uh, the smaller Asian states are supported when they phase out coal. And in turn, well, like uh, 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 cheapest loans or, or direct investment subsidies for, for the upfront capital costs for renewables, uh, I would like to see basically then uh, this kind of scheme that this country should accept either the transformation of the energy sector or uh, a relatively high carbon price. I think this is something uh, Europe should also invest part of its political capital uh, to do something on the international scale. And, and the time is, is now ripe. And, and I would say it's a, a window of opportunity because United States has also accepted uh, to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, I'm not so convinced that this plan is completely realistic, but at least they've announced this. And then we should we should coordinate with Europe uh, together uh, that we, we 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 can achieve something at 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 an international scale. And this has a lot to do with climate justice because the smaller states, the poorer states, they might they cannot afford fully the uh, the transformation of the energy system. And we should give them support. And it's in our own interest because if they get support, so then in the end, they will contribute to the global public good of, of, of climate protection. So this is not a directly an answer to your questions uh, in Europe, but it seems to me it's an important answer regarding climate justice in, a, in uh, beyond Europe. Yes, definitely. I do agree that that is a very important issue. Linda, what are your thoughts on that? Sorry, you're unmuted again. again. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think that last point is, is a really important one because, um, you know, we have this very important climate talks coming up and it needs to be, there has to be something in it for everybody. And, the, and there has to be, I mean, there's a whole debate now about the, you know, the cl climate finance that the wealthy countries promised that they would deliver hundred billion um, dollars per year in climate finance. They have to do that. And they also have, we have to be very careful that we don't get back into stale debates about climate changes to benefit the richer countries against the poorer countries, because um, we know that poor, you know, they, it is a global phenomenon. I mean, one thing we should have learned from the pandemic, actually, is that when problems arise in one part of the globe, they very quickly can affect everybody. And, and we should have learned a bit of humility about the ability of nature to, to give us shocks. And I think many of us, I think that has been a, um, you know, a, warn, a warning shot across all of us that we really need to act today you know, we spend money, but this is not big money compared with the cost of the cost of acting. You know, if we'd have done more to think about pandemic preparedness in the past, maybe we wouldn't have had. You know, we would have been the cost the cost we're paying now of, of that pandemic. So, yes, the, the climate justice issues are very real. They're very real at global level. And in fact, my the first time climate change reality of it became home to me was in the early north in the early 2000s when i went to kenya i visited a very remote part of kenya and i met people there who were living with climate change then in a way that i hadn't really thought about i thought oh it's a future problem but no it's not and, and just the, their livelihood they were pastoralists in, in northern kenya and their lives were being destroyed but coming very concretely to your question about does the green deal address internal transfers within the European Union, financial transfers. Well, the, the money available now through this, these new recovery packages is, is aimed to do that. It's aimed to help countries build their resilience to climate change. And there is a new adaptation strategy from the European Union. Um, because I think that it's a bit different from other 
policy decisions that we're taking. The, I mean, climate change is happening. It's real. We don't have a choice whether or not to adapt to climate change. We have to do it. We have to find a way to do it. Um, but at the same time, I think we've had a lot of talk here about costs of climate change, but there will be some benefits to some of these technological changes on, on air quality. One of the biggest issues in Central and Eastern Europe, when I talk to colleagues there about coal-fired power, it's not simply the, you know, the climate impacts, it's the air quality impacts that people have on people's lives, shortening people's lives. And so I think the, when we talk about climate action, we need to have, we need to get policies which actually make people's lives better. And I think a number, a lot of them will make people's lives better in the long term. Of course, we have to have the, do the adaptation that's needed in water scarcity, et cetera. But we can also make changes to lifestyles which are positive for people. People can, you know, live in cities which are more livable in, they're more breathable in, where there's less crowded, less traffic. And so I think we should focus as well on some of the positive sides of having a, a better answer to the climate change. Yeah, I think that's definitely an important point to raise to not only sort of think about climate change as sort of a scary negative thing, but that there's also actually a lot of benefits to climate action and that we can improve a lot of people's lives. Um, then I would like to move on to the questions from the audience. So the first question, um, you've already both kind of talked a bit about more global issues in your uh, previous answers. Uh, but the question is, how should the EU Green Deal support global emissions reductions? Sorry, you cut out there. I couldn't, I lost this thing. Sorry. Um, so the question is, how should the EU Green Deal support global emissions reductions? So what role could it play within sort of the more global um, theme of climate change reduction? Well, the EU, of course, is only, I think it's 9% now of global emissions. And, um, but I think what the EU could, could be, it could be a very good model for, for other parts of the world that in, in an advanced economy, you can make reductions in emissions and at the same time continue to um, run successful economies. So the EU, the, I think the EU is gonna be pivotal I mean, we're hosting the climate talks, not the EU, Europe's hosting the climate talks in, in Glasgow. How Europe, how, and I think, but I think the UK needs to work with its European partners because although the UK might have left the EU, we haven't left Europe and will always be a European power and a European country. So I think, so the European, Europe is central to the climate discussions that are going to happen. Europe can, be in the dialogue is, is in dialogue with China on emissions and although there are tensions with China at the moment I'm pleased that the dialogue around climate is still there and there's a recognition on all sides that we need to work together to tackle climate. Um, there's a new opportunity for Europe to work with um, President Biden and that is a game changer the fact that um, um, at every level that we have an American president who takes the climate crisis seriously. So I think Europe will be pivotal in the climate talks at the COP. And, um, and also we have relationships, of course, as the EU with many other countries, other parts of the world. And we have diplomatic links and trading links. And we can use the leverage of those links as well to push for climate action. That's why one of the most important parts of the whole climate, of the Green Deal, is reform of EU's trade policy to be more um, in line with Paris Agreement. Yeah, I, I think uh, okay. Th th that's a very a very kind interpretation. I think um, first of all, we have now in Europe this debate on on the so-called CBAM, so carbon border adjustment mechanisms, and it is quite clear that when we want to achieve carbon neutrality by two thousand fifty, uh, that this raises a lot of competitiveness issues. Uh, in, in the industry sector uh, and also in the other sectors. Now, there, there are two options here. The, the first option is uh, to impose, to a certain extent, carbon border adjustment mechanisms, which basically means we might impose some kind of tariffs on, on carbon-intensive products in order to, 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 to secure our own industry and to 
uh, enhance their competitiveness. I think this is, by and large, at the level of ambitions we, which we, we have now, uh, not a very successful and not a very promising pathway. I'm not against a uh, moderate application of implementation of CBAM, but by and large, what we need is cooperation, cooperation between the US and China. And I think when, when we want to, to, to pursue, on the one hand, that we achieve a carbon neutrality, but on the other hand, that, that we, 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 meant, we, we try to manage the trade flows in the right direction. So we need on both sides of the Atlantic, a very ambitious carbon pricing scheme. Because whatever we do is uh, we, we have to be sure and we have to be, uh, it's clear that carbon intensive products are uh, uh, basically comes with, with the price internally in the United States. And the same is true for, for China. And I think the G3, I would say that the climate G3, uh, forming a climate club uh, would be from my point of view, uh, a first step. And then for this climate club, the, some kind of, a carbon border adjustment make, might be used in order to incentivize other countries to, to, to join that club. But I believe at an international scale, it is absolutely essential that we not just raise the ambition uh, uh, in, in terms of, of quantity targets, but to, 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 to impose and, and, and to, to create a situation where we have a ratchet up process uh, for, for carbon prices on both sides of the Atlantic, I know. There's a long way to go, but I think this is an absolutely necessary ingredient for the European Green Deal. Thank you so much. Um, then we've also received another question, which is more on the technological side. Um, so it asks, what if the technologies behind negative emissions don't achieve CO2 removal targets? Would carbon prices have to increase dramatically closer to 2050? Yeah, so that this negative emission technologies that's that's uh, that creates a lot of headaches because uh, I would say that there are a, uh, there is a there are a lot of options, but I think one option which needs pilot projects is direct air capture. Uh, that seems to me is an important one because I don't believe that the large scale use of biomass and burning biomass and then uh, uh, capture the CO2 and, and, and store it uh, in geological undergrounds is, is the, most promising, um, the, the most promising option. And uh, so, um, and for negative emissions, you, you, need, you need the opposite of a carbon price. You need, you need subsidies because otherwise uh, people will not implement such a thing. And there is also um, a lot of options in the agriculture sector for, for negative emission technologies. The problem is uh, we have a lot of debate in, in, in scientific journals. We have a, a lot of thoughts, a lot of ideas, but we have not no credible or not sufficient credible pilot projects. And I think that's, uh, that's important that now at the EU level, we invest at least in pilot projects in order to figure out so what can be scaled up and what not. Thank you. Linda, do you have any views well, on that? Just, just a quick word to add. I mean, some of the, these technologies don't exist yet. We don't know whether they can work. And um, that's why it's very important that we don't use the promise of future technology. And I think Otmar said this in his opening remarks, not to act now. That's the most important thing, that we have to act now. Because in the past, I was involved in discussions around carbon capture and storage for the power sector in the late um, 2000s. And in fact, we don't need, we didn't need to be, you know, that would have been not a good investment because we can get, we can use renewables. So you can go down the wrong pathway. And sometimes people push these future solutions, technological solutions, you know, in a way to dampen down the ambition for now. So I think no. if these happen. Um, no, no, but, but this, this, I think we have this, this debate should, we should stop this debate because of course, there is absolutely this promise of a future technology uh, cannot be used to, 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 to stop ambitions now. However, we need negative emissions if we, even if we will be very successful. And here we need pilot projects. And I, I wouldn't say 
this technology does not exist. There are a few pilot projects for direct air capture, but it's it's it's, it's a scaling up issue. And and we need, by the way, these technologies also for the e-fuels. So we we cannot allow that for the e-fuels we use CO2 uh, uh, caused by burning fossil fuels. This is not the carbon neutral pathway. And 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 for that we 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 have to speed up. And and this cannot be an excuse not to reduce emissions now. So this should be crystal clear. Uh, but but there is a, a there is a sector where it is very hard uh, based on our current technological knowledge. Uh, to 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 reduce emissions, th th these emissions have to be compensated. It might be the case that in the future we have different technologies, but but this is something which which we we we, we need uh, more research and development, and we need uh, we need pilot project without without uh, uh, relaxing our ambition now. Yes, I think that is a great point to uh, to finish at. Um, that we need to be ambitious now, but also look into the future to new technologies and make use of those. Um, I believe that we could probably um, talk about this topic for many more hours, um, but since we've almost been going for one and a half hour, I think this is a great point to finish the event at. So uh, Linda and Otmar, thank you so much uh, for joining us for today's event. Um, and for everyone who's watching, I hope you've learned as much as I have and you enjoyed um, watching those amazing speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. You're welcome. And thank you very much for the very productive conversation. <laughs>